and um, this is my fat last class. Well, I'm last done. It sounds like you're relieved. <laughs> 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 well, what, what Can I ask a question? Like a band aid, and my throat is all swollen. I am so uncomfortable trying to hide it. So, do you mind if I just take this? <laughs> oh, yeah, please go ahead. I, look well, like we should be comfortable. I escaped from the convent. <laughs> I wondered why you had such a time. Well, but it, I mean, it's not, it means it's not all black and blue, and it, I don't look like I was strangled, but it's like this. Is that all right? Yeah, yeah. that's okay. Do you need it? I'm fine. No, no. We'll pretend that it's a tattoo. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, Dr. Clark no, no, didn't tell us. I surgery. And they put a, a, a implant in my trachea because I have a paralyzed vocal cord to push my vocal cord back in line because I had polio as a child and my vocal cord got in your vocal cord so the mine was like this so they put something here to make it stand up and it, it's about an eight week uh, but, but, but I had it a week and a half ago wow. so there are no stitches but these are the band aids. It looks a little gross, but <laughs> yeah. look, we won't. You had a mention in tweet. Um, we didn't have no tweet. Well, it looked a lot worse when it was all black and blue. Oh, black and blue. <laughs> Everybody thought that he had tried to strangle me. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're, if you're annoyed, I can touch on you. No, no, no. I'm not bothered at all. No. <laughs> well, Dr. Clark was there at the be kind of the beginning, actually before the beginning of GBAE, right? And so. I would like to just for you to start talking about how you got involved in. We mentioned Simrel. Did you all read Simrel? You were involved in that, right? No, Swirl. Swirl, that's right. Southwest okay. Region Lab. Southwest. Okay, so if you can just start talking about where you were when all this started, <laughs> and how you got to meet Elliot Eisner and all that good stuff. And then. Okay. Um, I was a sixth grade teacher in San Diego, and I got a telephone call from a friend of mine one time and he said there's there's a program called experience teacher fellowship and you might be interested and I said okay so he told me a bunch of things and finally he let me know that the deadline for getting my application in was the end of that week which was insane <laughs> I, I, I raced to the education center in San Diego I talked to several people and, and it ended up, I sent in an application. I never thought I'd get chosen. But I got chosen, so I was very lucky. Elliot Eisner had a program at Stanford University for Experienced Teacher Fellowship. And that, what that amounted to was you, you had to have eight years class, you know, something between one and eight years classroom teaching. And, and a desire to improve yourself academically. So I went to Stanford and I did that program. Two other people came with me and, and they were from other parts of the country actually. But at the end of the, third, except end of the first year, I, I went to Elliot and I said I'd like to stay on and, and do a doctorate. I had a master's from San Diego State College. And so to make a long story short, I ended up doing a doctorate at Stanford. And while I was there, I was working with a number of different people, but the two that you want to know about were Michael Day and Dwayne Greer. And Michael Day and Dwayne Greer and I spent two years working together in various roles as graduate students for Elliot. So at the end of that time, I remember vividly racing around the country and interviewing for jobs and everywhere I went, either either Dwayne or Mickey or, or St uh, Steve Dobbs, who was also with us, had, had already been there. So it was, it was a big major competition, who's gonna get what? And um, I ended up getting a job at Indiana University. I thought that was fairly temporary and I've been here ever since. So. <laughs> Great shock to stay here this long. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Duane became very, very active as a promoter of art education in California. And he got very associated with a number of different people, one of them turned out to be Lonnie Latin Duke, 
I don't know if you know the name, but Lonnie Latin Duke was, was extremely influential in, in forming uh, what eventually became discipline-based art education. Uh, Mickey Day came the year after Dwayne. Dwayne came the year I was there, and then Dwayne, Mickey came the year after. And the three of us became very good friends, and, and we did a lot of things together. And Dwayne, in the meantime, had associated himself with Lonnie Duke, and they had a lot of conversation. And it turned out Lonnie Duke was I forget what her role exactly, but she was part of the Getty Foundation, the G-E-T-T-Y, J. Paul Getty. J. Paul Getty was a monumentally wealthy man who ran an oil company across the United States and had a huge fortune and died and he left a will. And believe it or not, this is what the will said. I leave my money to the improvement of art education in the United States. That's the whole will, every word of it. So they went through about a year and a half of arguing amongst themselves and arguing with everybody else and listening to a lot of different people about what they were going to be doing. But Duane, in the meantime, was meeting with, with Lonnie about art education in the state of California. And she very shockingly said to him one day, well, how would you like a grant to, to do some of these things that we've been talking about? And he said, she said, yeah, we had no idea what she was talking about, but she was talking about several million dollars. Oh. <laughs> and we spent that money over the next four years, four, four and a half years, and... What a nice problem. <laughs> that sounds like a nice problem. Yeah, it, it was. It was an, well, it wasn't nice, <laughs> but it was interesting. Well, it was interesting. Tell them why it wasn't nice. Yeah, I'm just thinking how to go about that kind of play. You can just tell. Like it is. Is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What do you care? Go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ronnie Duke sent Duane to Elliot Eisner to talk about this grant and, and the money that was available and what, what we should do. And, and Elliot and Mickey, Mick, uh, Elliot and Duane met several times and, and then Ronnie Duke got involved in those meetings. And the next thing that happened, I got a letter, Mickey got a letter, Mickey Duane, Dickie Dick. We both got a letter asking us to participate in this grant. And, and, and Ronnie Duke had asked us to write a document that would outline fairly well what she meant by what she had come to call, through Duane's influence, discipline-based art education. And that's, that's the whole crux of, of the, the money that was behind us. And it was, it was quite shocking to be aware that there was all this money behind us and we could do just about anything we wanted in one sense of the word. But Duane had, you read the, you read Duane's two papers, right, for this one? Okay. That was required. Those papers were the foundation of what we did, literally. Uh, they outlined what he called, at that time, I don't mean, he didn't use the term disembaced art education. He called it something else. Yes, did. did he, did he yeah, use it? Okay, he did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, we spent literally three years writing together and, and arguing together and ultimately sitting down with a group like you, only much larger, and arguing about this. And we did this all across the country. We argued with art teachers, we argued with artists, we argued with other people representing the other disciplines in art education. And, and this was the unpleasant part of, of having all that money and being able to do what we wanted in a sense. But we had a fascinating time. And Mickey and Duane and I went through at least four or five rewrites of 
of what eventually became the paper that, that was the foundation of this one based art education. And that's what looks really nasty. You know, well, you're you're interesting. You're interesting. You, you're interesting. It makes it more interesting. Tell us. We would go to these. I was never part of it. I was a critic of. So but we would go to these meetings, and there would be maybe I don't know fifty well-known art educators from around the country at some fancy place with hot tubs and all kinds of. Anyway, we. And what they did was everybody wanted the money. It was, in the end, six or seven million dollars. And people wanted access, so what they did was that they critiqued everything about that they were doing. And this was terrible, that could do better, this was awful. Mm. And then they were, it was a very nasty mm. kind of a, an environment, because people thought if they could get rid of the three of you, because you called yourself the Three Stooges, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which is a comedy team. You a long time ago, even at, you should have worn your sweatshirt. <laughs> three Stooges, because people were, and you see in life, the better you do, the more people are jealous, the more they try to get you a piece of the cake. And, but you people persevered, and since they um, didn't have really much influence in but it was quite nasty. And there was a shoe that was thrown at one point. <gasps> no? <laughs> that was an, um... Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're thinking of Hillary. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but they, they were very, it was, it was not as nice. Because mm -hmm. in, the, in the visual arts, there, was a, there were that many large monies available to people. And so, uh, People were very jealous. And there were all kinds of things where if you were sitting at a table at our national conference with one of the officers from the Getty, then everybody was looking, why is that person there, not me? I should be there, I'm better than you are. Mm -hmm. So, but you gotta be tough. And you gotta keep believing what you're doing. <laughs> and, and, you know, and so, so that, that's what I, you didn't want to talk about. Oh, we, we, we made it. <laughs> innumerable presentations to the group, and the, the group meaning different groups all across the country. And it, at every session, we would end up utterly exhausted talking about discipline-based art education and what we thought it ought to be. And nobody had any else real inclination of this, typically, in the group, the people coming. They weren't familiar with the term, and they weren't familiar with what Grain had intended when he wrote the first paper, and it was it was a long struggle of, of uh, both excitement and pure utter disgust about what was going on. It was a very very strange time. You, you've got to realize that this grant that we had represented more money than the government had ever spent on art education since the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. This was one, one grant. <laughs> so everybody was jealous of it. Everybody was angry at us because we ended up with the money. And, and they didn't know how to handle them themselves. And very often, it became a, a, a whole session of accusation and challenge and, and so on. We, we presented what we were trying to do at each of these meetings. And eventually, it, it, it died down. I mean, the, the last couple of meetings we had were, were very small, and they were not representing people that were trying to get the grant, but they were really representing people that were interested in discipline-based art education. So that, that's the, the, the history of the whole thing. But, but you have to realize, we went through at least three years of this utter challenge every time we had a meeting, mm -hmm. and having to defend ourselves and having to defend the concepts that we were trying to put across. It was, it was tough, it was, it was not pleasant. <laughs> and also, it was an environment that had been low in, you, you talked about low in power. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that was more who I really like, low in power, but creativity, <laughs> and I always have. And, but 
it wasn't Lowenfeld and creativity that was the issue. It was the way it was interpreted in the United States, in classrooms, where you just put out materials and kids made things and expressed themselves. And, and I personally think the same thing is happening today. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you don't, and, and the idea of the discipline was all the different sciences, um, and the Woods Hole Conference and other conferences with science and math, and, and, and so the visual arts were trying to, through Duane's interpretation, have some structure so that it, the visual arts looked more like a discipline mm -hmm. than, it, than it was like make and take and, and have fun doing all this stuff. But this also influenced the music, too. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah. And Every subject. Every. Did you find that um, eventually, you know, that you, this was presented to, to art teachers through a kind of a structure they had, did you find that classroom teachers were as accepting or more accepting than art teachers to this new method? Or can you speak to that at all? So. So, okay. <laughs> Not too many, but some. <clears throat> People across the country really weren't of a mind to accept discipline-based art education. It, it was it was a different concept than they were used to. It was it was representing different activities than they were used to in the classroom, and and it, everything about it was a challenge to what had gone on for years and years and years. So it was it was a turmoil time. It was it was upsetting to a lot of art teachers. And that went on many years after we put it in, into place. And, and I, I, I can, I, <laughs> it, it, I, I want to get distracted here by too many stories, but <laughs> I can remember calling a local woman whom I knew very well, who was art supervisor of the local district, and saying that Duane and I had been working on this project and I, I left out something very important here. Let me backtrack a moment. I had been at Ohio State University, and I was asked by Duane to come to California and work with him in what was at that time one of the regional laboratories across the country. There was a time, this was during the Eisenhower administration. Hmm. <clears throat> There were 21 regional laboratories established across the United States. And each of the regional laboratories was asking the schools to look at critically at what they were doing, what they were using, what they were asking the students to do, and all of these things. And they were trying to, to build up what, what everybody would call discipline-based education in whatever form that might take. Now, that could take different forms in different subject matters, of course. But the whole idea was that discipline-based was on everybody's mind. 90% of them were against it, <laughs> maybe 10 or 12% were for it, but it was, it was a very fascinating time. And a lot of things were happening across the country that are still happening. Uh, there, there, are, there are shades of DBAE or various kinds of, of discipline-based subject matters, but they're still operating in the schools. And there are some that, of course, got thrown out a long time ago. And that was true of art education, unfortunately. But when, when we started going around and, and holding teacher workshops and introducing the concepts that were in that paper by Duane and modified somewhat when we wrote the basic DBAE document, <clears throat> Most teachers thought it was pretty exciting and they wanted to try these things out. And we went along for, oh, three, three and a half years, quite positive about all this three and a half years we'd already spent being miserable all that time. And we were, we were in getting DBAE introduced across the country pretty well. And believe it or not, there are a couple of workshops that got established at that time that are still being held in, in two universities, one in the Pacific Northwest and one in the uh, middle of the country in the north. So DBA is never gone, but it's, it's, it's been modified very, very, very greatly yeah. by, by all kinds of courses. Every state, 
I think by about 10 years ago, every state, the standards, when they started developing these core standards, mm -hmm. every state had, at its heart, this one based on education, That's true. in some form or another. So eventually it became, and then of course everything goes in cycles. Mm -hmm. So what happened was there was such emphasis on discipline that people forgot about creativity and self-expression. And it, and it was more like, um, you know, it was more modeling. Teacher would do something and everybody would follow up and do something similar. Like the whole idea of a, a, a student at, at any level, mostly middle school and even high school, but upper elementary, developing their own body of work, to, picking their own questions to um, explore and, 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 and do critical thinking and problem solving. And kind of went out the door a lot because TBA had bunches of textbooks by Laura Chapman. And you also worked on the Squirrel film series, those, those film, films, film strips, which really gave you an outline of uh, yeah. how to do it. But it was a lot of learning, a lot of looking at art, talking about art, and making things. But, but it's still, everything goes to extremes, and then it comes back to the middle again. So, so, um, so it, it, it's, it's interesting that um, and they have this wheelie furniture. I know. It's <laughs> a <laughs> you know, I have a feeling that just like it goes going on. It's really fun. <laughs> what I want to say now is, is basically very, very crudely and very superficially. But anyway, what? we intended with DBAE. When, when we started out, we, we had many, many, many arguments amongst ourselves, and, and this went on from place to place to place to place. And it took a lot of working out. But basically, what we were talking about was not doing what they call make and take. Do something in the classroom, take it home, and show it. The, the whole idea was that if, if there was a creative product in mind of some kind, a creative solution possible, and so on, all these things. We wanted to bring those out. But we wanted to do it in a way that was very different than our teachers were doing, typically. So if, if, if we started out, they say we're going to do a ceramic test. We would break that down into at least four steps. This would be to introduce ceramics, to explain some of the principles that the student had to have in mind when they were doing ceramics, so that we would have activities where you learn how to throw or, or learn how to disassemble something, whatever. More activities that would be more advanced in that. And these are all you know, more and more difficult as we get. When we get to this end, we would have an open-ended assignment. And that was where students were expected to use what we taught them. Now, Enid may disagree with me on this, but the whole idea of these activities leading up to the open-ended assignment was built systematically. If we were painting, then we learned how to paint. If we were doing printmaking, we learned how to print make it, and whatever it was. But then we would give an open-ended assignment where the students could use what they, had, what they had learned in these activities. And our worst enemy always was the art teacher. It was, it, was, it was amazing. I had art teachers curse me up one wall and down the other wall for telling the kids what to do. That, that, that's an interesting phenomenon when you're representing discipline-based art education. But, but the, the whole idea that you have in mind that they're going to use these skills in the open-ended assignment, but you wanted to teach those basic skills before you made the open-ended assignment. And this was unfamiliar to most art teachers. Very few art teachers had any conception of this. But actually, they pretty much used 
different, a lot of teachers used textbooks where they, where they actually followed recipes almost, try to do things. Well, sure. Yeah. And, and then they didn't do the open-ended assignment. Well, a lot of them never did the open-ended assignment. Right. <laughs> a lot of the, the, the textbooks, for example, the Hubbard textbooks. The Hubbard and Rouse and the Chapman were the biggest ones. They, they tended to cover the first three, but you never felt like that they freed you to do the other one. And I think that's what a lot of teachers complained about. Yes. But those textbooks were really geared not to our teachers so much as no. to classroom teachers. Classroom yeah. teachers. That's right. Well, I should stop. I want to. I want you. You've read a formula of about formidable amount of literature. <laughs> Do you have any questions that you want me to answer from those readings? They're all supposed to have questions. Yes, they are supposed to have questions. Because that is wonderful question. class. <laughs> wonderful <laughs> questions. Okay. Okay. Um, well, the, they, they talked about the four, you talked about the four different areas that was like studio art, aesthetics, Criticism um, and art history, right. and so how? So so when you have something like that, like one area of art, like ceramics, is that a, would that be the studio art, or would that? Would, how how are they break breaking it up into the okay. four? Okay, we, we introduced in these three lessons mm -hmm. prior to the opening of the lesson. We introduced artists and artworks, okay. and we did this with this whole series of film strips. That he had mentioned. We developed, I don't know how many. It was SWRL. We, we, we developed S -S four, yeah, no, we developed two major notebooks this big at each grade level, covering that one grade level. And for each of those notebooks, there were 16 film strips. And in those film strips, they were introduced, for instance, here to ceramicists. They were introduced to ceramics, what they looked like. And they were introduced to all kinds of related concepts out of art history, art criticism, studio work, and art history. Aesthetics. 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 And, and this was what put teachers off because they were never used to this. They, they, weren't, they had no conception of, of using the disciplines meaning those four, as the, 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 the enrichment of a, of a lesson. Did you have a question? Yeah, I did. <clears throat> How, I read, I, when I was reading the article, I was like, oh, like this, I don't know, I guess this wasn't what I thought DEA was. I, I you know, because, I don't know, okay. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> How did they go from being, I actually like I created a unit because I, I do ceramics. I created a high school unit and it's exactly like this. Like I was like, oh that's exactly what I did. Like it introduces it, you talk about like the different techniques that they would know, and then it presents them with like an open question that they would then use all their stuff to create. So how did it go from this to what was put in place in the classrooms of almost like standardized everyone producing the same thing? Well, you're asking how does how does this lead to standardized testing for it? No, uh, standardized, standardized work. like the standardized projects. And again, going back to the textbooks, you know, <laughs> one of my um, like almost like examples like, would be like here's a, a little bit about <clears throat> bas relief. Here's an artist who did a bas relief. Here yeah, is a little a bit of study. Relief. And now here's a four by four inch piece of plastic, and you're going to use. In that particular case, it was a paper clip and do a bar relief, you know. And that, so how did this openness end up being such a so narrow and so, well, so narrow? What, what happened, and again, you already mentioned this. People did this and they did this and they did this and they tended not to do this because this was not comfortable. That's hard. Right? Mm -hmm. that's this was hard. very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. They weren't used to doing this. And the whole idea of open-ended assignment is unbelievable for a person who, who's taught typically previously. But I guess I feel like Lowenfeld's so open-ended itself right. that 
that that would be more comfortable for them rather than the talking about the art history and going into the criticism. I, I know you. I know you probably don't have an answer, but it's just it's interesting, like the way <laughs> people took it and they kind of made it into this weird, well, different. The creature. film strips that we that we developed and, and they were. I wish I, I, should, I should have brought some. I didn't. Uh, the film strips that we developed all introduced artists, artworks by artists, but they also the first introduction would be photographs of natural scenes, regardless of what we're doing. I mean, this would be a <coughs> photograph of a typical outdoor scene or some kind or whatever. This would, this would in introduce artists. This one would introduce criticism. And, and we would, they would learn to critique what they were looking at before they ever made anything. Mm -hmm. But then this never got done. <laughs> but also, what happened was the teachers would would go through this and complain unbelievably about the fact that we were telling them what to teach and when to, when to teach and how to teach, but they never carried it onto this level. But if you're a sociologist, pretend you're a sociologist, go into the school. Why would well, you people know why art, visual art, music, and health, or P, um, what's wrong with me? Because I still have anesthesia in my head. <laughs> visual art, music and phys ed, why, why, why were those three subjects in the 50s even, why were they formed in the schools? They didn't exist in the schools till then. Why were they formed? Does anybody know? I would guess to give teachers a break. <laughs> that it was the unions, and the unions wanted teachers to have a break. And so they took those three subjects and they said, when the kids, your children, are going to these activities, mm -hmm. you're going to do the important work. And, you, cause, and they, because they needed them. Otherwise, it was too much. And mm -hmm. so, so, always, art has not been seen in the schools as being very important or useful or worthwhile, mm -hmm. really, to be honest. And, and except if art teachers became leaders and they, they really advocated for their field, and they work with other disciplines to become important in their schools. So what happens is people, when they go out, even in this um, school district, most of them, at one point, were all my students. Your students are mostly mine and Gail's and then yours. After about three or four years, they're doing make and take. Why? Because parents want make and take to take home from the classrooms. They want little things that they can do. The principal wants something for, for, for I don't know, for to, ad, to advertise things in the school or band concerts. Or, well, anyway, you know, and so you're, you're really, your answer to what you're saying is what the expectation of the culture in the schools is and, and what we think is important. I, you, know, you know, still far apart, and I go to the, um, the elementary um, art show here in town, right here in the museum, and it's not really different than what I was teaching. I don't know, 50 years ago. There's still, well, it's still not, it, it, it's expected what you're gonna find there. People are more like the way they've always been, and it's very hard to change the culture. Uh, Laura Chaplin, and Chaplin called it, the school art. Yeah. Well, I just, I think anything that's open-ended is, is a risk. So the more exactly. embattled the teacher feels, the more likely they are to go to the thing that always works. Mm -hmm. And by works, I mean that the parents put on their fridge at home and, and feel positive about yeah. it. Whereas if little <laughs> Timmy comes home with like a free-form who's he, what's it, then, then <laughs> to us might say, ah, you know, it's an expression of the haptic um, capability, or, you know, or, and I'm not trying to be sarcastic. I mean, it yeah. could be really cool, but I mean, who here has had the experience with mom or dad of the, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> if they don't recognize it, they're not going to put it on the mantle. Yeah, and and in a sense, perhaps what what the difference is that what most teachers were doing was somewhere between C and D. In other words. I gave you the example the first time I tried it. The kids were complaining, when are we going to make art? They didn't 
They didn't look at art. And Lowenfeld said, don't ever show them adult models when you're at the lower grades. Yeah. They didn't look at art. They didn't talk about art. You went in and you said, oh, today it's Halloween. We're going to make a witch today. And here's what my witch looks like. And everybody made a witch. Yeah. OK. So the open ended was that you could put the hat on this side or you could right. put it on this side. You know, you could put the bow here or you could put it here. But it's all pretty much the same. Yeah. But here, there are all those three steps that you have to do before you make the art. And then the art is open ended. So all of those things were completely different than teachers were used to. Right. But teachers did adopt looking and talking about art. They and they did. mostly do it. Most teachers do it, and they still do it when I've gone into many classrooms all over the world that the teachers are now looking at art more as a subject where you do look and talk about art. You can, um, there are some really interesting things um, looking at more political and social action use of art and all kinds of ways of using art now that were completely not part of the literature right when, before but, but but the pull to be to do what's expected more than what's really meaty and important mm -hmm. is always there so uh, you know it's yeah, I was just going to say it, it kind of sounded in one way that each of these steps would have their own project that was a little maybe yeah, a little yeah, more yeah, make yeah. and take yeah. and then you would it would they would build on each other and lead to an <coughs> open-ended yeah. project that was illustrating that yeah um, now what, what teachers can't stand I used to do this in my own classroom when you do the activity related to this when you finish you throw it on the floor yeah to be swept up at, out of the room. When you finish this one, it goes on the floor. Uh, when you finish this one, it goes on the floor. These are evidence that you are learning what you need to use when you get to this stage. But if you don't do this stage, there's no yeah, text the right, okay. It doesn't work. And um, Dwayne Fayer has actually uh, said um, about the time frame that the DBAE should use for one hour of art per week at the elementary level and one course at the secondary level. How did that fit with how much time was allocated for art at the time? Was it being like compromised? Or I don't remember those um, that so article? The most, uh, yeah, it did say that. And, and many states did adopt that, but they were. For example, in Indiana, and my, this was my experience when I was teaching, we had to, students had to have one hour of art per week. 35 minutes of that was taught by the specialist teacher. I taught 35 minutes, and then theoretically, their classroom teacher taught 25 minutes of it. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the classroom teachers were to use DBAE. But what they, in fact, used was usually mimeograph sheets, uh, you know, color this, you know, find the letter. B and color everything green that's got the letter B on it, that type of thing. Yeah. So it was really variable. And then at the high school level, a lot of high schools in like small communities didn't offer art, or they offered it like Spencer, for example, had one art teacher, and students took art as an elective, or they could take music, or they could take, I think, phys ed or shop or something like that. And you would have your first, second, third year students all in the same classroom, ceramic students, everybody took the same class. So you had to modify it based on economics. And, it was and like kind of pragmatic in response to what right. was available. But ideally then, if you're doing a, <coughs> how much time do you need to teach with a DBAE method? And also to cover several media. Well, of course, that, that varied across the country. But we would, we would insist on, on some kind of a time schedule whereby you had the time to cover these things. And, and that in itself is irritating to a lot of people because we were asking for more time than art was typically given in most, in most districts. But there's no, you know, whatever time you have, you should fill it with whatever you can that's good and worthwhile. But all around, the, that was a big, People were upset because they felt that it was mandated, that it took too much time to look and talk about art, that they should, kids should be making. So that what happened, there was, a, in the beginning, people 
were learning how to do this, they spent more time looking and talking than they did making, and people yes. became upset. Because they said, art is a studio subject, so we should be learning about it, you know, through our history, criticism, and doing it some aesthetic talk, looking at it. But that really more time should be devoted, because making something takes more time than, and, and, and I think, Eventually, that's what happened. But in that article, if I remember correctly, Dwayne Greer was advocating for as much time for looking and talking and criticizing, and and that was um, and that wasn't really what was intended in in the discipline based. Well, part of it was. Part of it was. But part of, part of the discipline based was that students should know artists and they should know artworks. And they should know a broad spectrum of what the, that represents. Typically, most kids have nothing, no idea of what an artwork really might look like. <laughs> well, yeah, but but they people then really did. There was all these demonstrations that the Getty had, where with children would get up and really talk about art. Yes. But they hardly ever made anything. There was, but everything in life is this way, and then you have a reaction this way, and you try to come to the center. At some point, it changed, and then there was less emphasis on them talking, and it, I'm, I'm coming back to it being a studio um, subject where people made things. So, so that's always been a tension. Are you an artist teacher or a teacher artist, and whether the teachers should be more artists, and and, and so, and, and then what is expected and to be... But, but one thing to realize, too, the time period that this was in, um, there weren't a lot of visual things to look at. You know, we didn't have the internet, and uh, color reproductions were very, very expensive. And one of the blessings of Getty was that they had so much money to back people who wrote textbooks and those Davis prints that people bought, and they were expensive. It was yeah, like $500 they, a set, right. <laughs> but didn't schools get some kind of a bond well, or yeah, something yeah, that bought? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Schools that had their teachers and principals go to these workshops got a lot of free materials mm -hmm. that they could use in the classrooms. When I, I just think back when I started teaching well, women art and education course, there were no color slides of women's artwork, hardly at all. You know, now you could get color slides of anything. It's on the internet. It's very different. Um, you know, the, the, the way um, things have evolved. But I think deep down, people still don't value the arts the way they should. And in this state, there were there's a lot there. There was recently, because you look back on uh, your question. Um, that they would said that if the people had a first license, I don't know, it still hasn't passed. If you have a first license in any subject, and you can pass a content test, with, then you can become an art teacher. And I was at a meeting, and I said, "Well, what if you're an art teacher, and you and and you can pass a science or math test? Can you teach those subjects? Oh no, those are real subjects." And we, yeah. So. So it's really, what is the value of the arts in the United States in the schools? And, and I don't think, looking back on a very long career, that the value of what we do has changed that much. But I don't know whether you or you get to think about that. I think, that. I think it's pretty much the same. Yeah, what about you, Gil? Well, yes and no. I'm up to We're up to this. <laughs> Ian and I had a program for a number of years here called... Uh, Which one? The, the junior high kids. Oh, um, the IU Summer Arts Institute. IU Summer Arts Institute. We brought in the students from grades 7 through 9, and, and we put them through all kinds of crazy experiences. But one of the things that we did I used to I used to have what they call looking and talking about our sessions, and and we would go in in the evening to a classroom or wherever with a screen, and we would show up images by artists, and we would talk about them, 
We never talked about the name of the artist. We never talked about the title of the artwork. We never talked about anything that was that kind of typical information. We talked about what's going on in the artwork. And could they see it? And at the beginning, they could not. <laughs> And by the time we got to the end of a week of that, they, were, they would talk and talk and talk and talk. One day, it was opening of Super Spider-Man. Spider-Man was they opening in town. To and one of our major counselors told the kids he would take them to see Spider-Man. And it turned out that I had done looking and talking about art the day before. And everybody- A week before, we can have another session of it. Well, he, he, he was, it was the one boy went to see the movie and the rest of them wanted to do looking and talking about art. And you know what they, they loved said, it. They said nobody ever listened to me or cared about what I thought about anything. Right. And this was a chance to do that. So you think of it in terms of history, you know, of doing art, a history and music and integrating art with a lot of other subjects and working with what's and you know, the, the, then, then it becomes very important, and and it's it's part of a um, whole learning experience. And this is this is a lot. That reminds me of the presentation that you gave the other day. Uh, Jean is our museum person. Well, Jeannie, Jeannie, and, Jeannie, <laughs> Jean and, and uh, but Jeannie, and did you both see that same presentation yeah. in ADA? Uh, no. but I think are you talking about the emotion one? Yeah, uh, that that one you weren't at. We did good ten circles together. Oh, okay. Yeah. So and tell a little bit about what you saw because that oh. I think would be the kind of thing that you would want to be. Well, let me see what I can come up with. Uh, <laughs> top of my head, um, the professor's name was Beth and. Ament, and she was oh, formerly know. at Eastern Michigan yeah. University, um, and now she's a consultant. And she presented on the role of emotion in interpreting art. Mm -hmm. And so I come out of the tradition, tradition, if it's been around long enough, um, <laughs> BTS that does not really address that specifically. And um, so I had always been told by my bosses that you don't really want to get into the emotional content. You want to really stick with the factual material. But her argument was that um, neuroscientists have really made a very strong argument that emotion plays a very strong role in learning, mm -hmm. which is a, no surprise to anyone but me. <laughs> and uh, and that especially in working with younger children, it is critical to acknowledge what's going on with them emotionally before going mm -hmm. further into the interpretation. Is that kind of what you're looking for? It could be dangerous. That was kind of my critique of it. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I taught a class here at the university called Looking and Talking About Art. And I would start off the class with maybe seven artworks up on the wall here in, in, in big, what, what, what's the name of the company? Davis. Davis. And we would talk about these briefly, and then I would take about two thirds of them down because these are the ones everybody wanted to talk about. So then they had to talk about the ones they didn't want to talk about. And that was very interesting because one of the things that would happen is that these represented emotional states. And people were very unwilling to talk about that. So when you the, the course that you're talking about now was this for college aged? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and and we actually we had a pretty long discussion in our meeting about who would be appropriate for this kind of discussion, who would not. And um, and I actually talked to Dr. Adams about it a little bit after her presentation too. And she herself expressed that there are limitations to the appropriateness of this. Sure. Um, she pointed out that in, with adults in a work situation, if you put her example was, well, what if you put up a nude and you said, how do you feel about this? You might ex actually out someone or uh, there could be very serious consequences. So she yes. really was arguing for with little kids. And the example she gave was that uh, two kindergarten teachers had very carefully prepped their kindergarten class with uh, a, what sounded from her brief description like a fairly DBA-ish derivative kind of a thing. Um, and that they were quite disappointed with the kids that their major question was why do these 
children in the images look so sad. Whereas if they had dealt with that emotional content up front, they probably could have gotten farther with the rest of the content that sure. they wanted to introduce. Sure. No, I had the same thing though. When I when I, I was in usually in that class in Florida, when when I would show an image and say, "What do you see?" No other questions. That question only. Somebody would finally get to the content of the emotional part of it. It would take a long time. But when it got to the emotional part, everybody clammed up. I, I think there's probably a couple of dynamics going on there, don't you? Sure. I, 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 I feel like I'm outing myself by making this confession, <laughs> but I often don't know how to respond to questions like, how does this artwork make you feel? Because, you know, I might not get it right or something, you know? That, that, there's a sort of sense out there with some folks in the arts, I get the impression that there's an answer that's correct about how I should be made to feel. Yes. And I'm not convinced that that's always accessible to the viewer. Um, the artist may have been using a visual language that's unfamiliar to me. So from that end, and then there's the other side, which is um, I, I'm a Midwesterner. And we do not go around discussing our feelings, particularly <laughs> in front of strangers. That That's right. That's is right. not done. Yeah. So both of those are exactly a right. challenge. Isn't, yeah. mm -hmm. isn't the science that in the brain where learning and emotions happen, they're so closely connected, mm -hmm. related, or closely, what is this? Mm -hmm. They're close to one another. <laughs> <laughs> that when, when you also, and I think that starts, they start going into like engagement when you start talking about things that are more um, personal and closely linked to the student, mm -hmm. it causes more connections in the brain, which makes the learning stick longer. I so, if you, yeah. yeah, if you think about like your learning experiences that you remember, they're usually emotional ones. I don't have a problem with that. Yeah. It's just that uh, we, what we were talking about in the meeting is how do you how do you word the question to get at that as opposed to right. just like, oh, <laughs> um, I feel that that is a very attractive nude figure. These, these, are, these, are, these are very serious problems for the art teacher. Mm -hmm. They really are. If you want them to do what we were talking about, they have to learn how to do it first. Yeah. Yeah. They're not trained to do this. Right. Yeah. And one of the things that happens in the art class, in the college classroom, we would start on an image and somebody would make some comment about the emotional quality. And immediately somebody would say, I don't see it that way. I see it mm -hmm. this way. And this opens up the whole group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because once you get that realization that there's other ways of seeing it, mm -hmm. then they've got something to talk about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you don't and they're fascinating to hear. An environment of trust in your yeah. classroom. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to, as a good teacher and leader, build that environment, know how to question. And, and it, it's not coming from the blue, it takes time mm -hmm. for people to feel comfortable yeah. doing yeah. that. And it's a real skill. Yeah. It's part of being a very good teacher who has, a, the way, where people are courteous and respectful of one another that, but we've had, do you remember you had a class once where, we've all had that, but I remember you had one, Marjorie, where people were talking about very intimate things that you oh, can. Yeah. And, and then you have to say sometimes, that's not appropriate yet right now. You know, you have to know when to. Mm -hmm. But but if, if you have that environment, but it, it doesn't come with, without a lot of um, work. Mm -hmm. uh, it has to be one of your goals as a teacher. When Ian and I had our summer class, you, we, we didn't explain. They were supposed to be gifted. They were supposed to be very uh, high ability in the high ability. Class. And, and the fact that they came with a, the intelligence and so on, when they would start talking about the artwork, it would start out superficial. But very quickly, it would get very deep because they would start arguing with one another. And their, their intellects are going like crazy. And, and that's, that's really what's exciting about this whole business. But I think what Gil just said is important that they were talking to one another, not yes. to you. That's right. You not facilitate um, any conversations in your class. That's right. But you don't um, t 
take over and you let people talk to one another. So people have questions right now. Mm -hmm. Jenny, yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So back to the article, the Courier's article. So it says the one of the purpose of the BBAE is, I think, to produce the educated adults to who can, uh, okay, who can uh, explicate, explicate the significance and the meaning of the artwork and able to appreciate artwork. And the Guglier said, uh, the landmark works of various kinds, including those that mark major movement of those that stand as major exemplar of the style, should be recognized as worthy of attention and study. So I have a question about the emotional, about the, sure. the artwork appreciation. So who and how they decided what is the important, what is worth of the work? Oh, or do they co uh, cover the contemporary art or artists because they are not yet evaluated? So <laughs> this is my question. Oh, well, what Dr. Zimmerman was just saying is important. Mm -hmm. when, when we would get a discussion going, I would withdraw, mm -hmm. literally. And uh, as long as the discussion kept going, I let it happen. Now that's dangerous. I mean, you, you never know what everybody's going to say. You never know what kind of crazy opinion is going to come from somebody. <laughs> but the fascinating thing is, is that somebody will say, wow, I never realized that. Or somebody will say, oh, I didn't see that. And all of a sudden, they're seeing the artwork totally differently because of what their neighbors are saying. And the interesting thing is that I would say 99% of the time, people would resolve the meaning of an image, not what they came in with, but what they left with. Mm -hmm. Because it would change as they heard other people making reference to the artwork. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how often somebody would say, I never saw that. Mm -hmm. But about choosing which artwork, mm -hmm. Is it interesting because why do you choose artwork? Not because the teacher's interested in it, not because you're interested in it, although if you've traveled, mm -hmm. you could bring in some things that have interested you when you travel, but mostly the, if you have a class of young people, um, elementary, middle, even high school, certain things are on their minds. Mm -hmm. They're worried about certain things, they want to know about certain things, things come up. Yeah, but if you have a discussion, you see, then you, they want to know more about this or that. Then, then the, the topics and the kind of artworks really are part of what's interesting to the students. And, and if they're studying, <coughs> say, the Civil War, then you look at, you know, photographs by Brady. Matthew Brady, or, you know, bring that in to say, you know, or, or you could say, what are you studying in the other classes? What's worrying you? What's interesting to you? And, and so, or, or you could say, now everybody bring in an artwork that is meaning for them and see what people are interested in. Because it's really about, it's about the students and not about you. But one of the criticisms of early DBAE right. was that they talked about great works of art, right. Western art. And there was a um, critique that they should have opened up. It should involve more cultural things, more contemporary things, more controversial works of art. And like but that was difficult because contemporary controversial images typically aren't available. Yeah. <laughs> or the school would be terrified. They are now. They are now. Yeah. But they, they weren't for a long time. And you, you, you had a question before. Well, when when. Um, Let's see, you, you, what were you just talking about? <laughs> and then I forgot my question. Um, oh, when you were saying, um, when they were saying, what do you see in this work of art, and you would let it be open, um, would you, like, say if it was a uh, new descending the staircase or something like that, where they didn't have the name of the art, and would you then at the end say, well, he was actually this, and this is what he intended, or, or would you just, but the end, with whatever they came up with. My students go crazy because they, they never got a resolution. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah. They no, never answer. They, they, they go out for themselves and they go find something else. 
actually. Yeah, they right, they, 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 they really want to know that. They'll go out and find it themselves. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, yeah. They will. Okay. And nowadays they can go on a computer and look it up, mm -hmm. and, and then you can say who was really interested, and then they can come and report back what they read, what they saw. Well, they have to describe it to Google. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so this t kind of ties into the second article that talked about Eflin made a critique of DBA yes. and talked about, you know, so this discussion and this idea of um, presenting these artworks, he, you know, he had said, is it a means or is it an end? And why can't it be both? Because it really seems like it's facilitating this new way of thinking for people mm -hmm. that hadn't approached it before. So. I guess my question is, is what is your take on that, or um, your opinion on an answer to that question? I, I, it's, it's very difficult to come up with an answer. When we talk about all the images that we have associated with these four steps, one of the things that, that every student comes away with is a barrage of, of, of imagery. Mm -hmm. and, and all of a sudden, they can handle it. But they couldn't at the beginning. Right. <coughs> and that's the resolution we were always looking for. Mm -hmm. We weren't looking for them to be able to remember the name of an artist, the name of an artwork, when it was produced, or something like that. But they could talk about the content. But it's looking for that critical thinking and the mm -hmm. ability to really just look at a piece of artwork mm -hmm. and take their own interpretation from it. Exactly. But or, or pick up somebody else's interpretation in the classroom. Right. And, and say, yeah, well, that makes more sense than what I thought yeah, originally. I thought. <laughs> and, and when you see that happening, you really appreciate it. You people don't realize, Brody called it in the magic store. The magic store. Yeah. I, 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 okay, a magic meaning imagery, a store of imagery. Not Target or something, but in a magic <laughs> store. So, so that, so that you can take, you don't realize how different you are visually. Most people are, in our culture, do, are more so now with so many visual images. But I know when I want to think of something, I always close my eyes and see it visually. We have so many images, and I, oh, that's a this and that's a that. This comes from here, that's from Most people don't know what they're looking at. And, and they don't know how to look. Mm -hmm. And even, um, we were big film fans, and of course with the new IU um, cinema, we, we go very often and the film, Netflix. But you know, you could just look at a film, not see it, not hear it, just for the story, right? It's this visual phenomenon. But you can also learn how to look at film and to see what filmmakers do and how they put things together. And, and old photographers, or and, and, and so it's the richness of the world around us. And it's, it's a way of developing your brain with the emotion and the, you know, and, and, and everything because we live now in such a visual culture mm -hmm. that I think it's a time for art education to really be important. But art education is being swallowed up by, you know, IT and a lot of it's very well, and well, that's another issue too. But it, it's being swallowed up by um, by people who are technologically good at getting images, but not knowing how to see. You have to learn how to see. To this this, really this see concept well. of a magic store is an amazing concept. Harry Brody from the University of Illinois first came up with this expression. I suppose that the idea isn't all that new, but the expression was. But the whole idea of have, giving kids in the magic store of art, think about it. How many kids have artworks that they can record experiences against? How many of them carry around in a magic store of 15, 20, 30 images that they can relate in a conversation? That's, that's an amazing concept. But also music and how music and art go together. And the boundaries between all the subjects now are much more permeable than they were when we yeah. were. And, and, and everything owes, overlaps with everything else. So to be a good teacher, you have to be informed about the world around you and looking at things. And Allie has been Allie's sitting over been here waiting. patiently trying to hold up her hand. And after her question and answer, 
We're going to take a break so you guys can get some refreshments, and I'll set up the. Okay. Oh, well, when you were talking about prepping teachers, um, the article cites you about the aesthetic eye project mm -hmm. and teacher preparation. I wanted to hear a little bit more about that. Oh yeah, that was fascinating. The balanced art yeah. practice. Mm. Dream. At one time was working as well. What one time he was, it, uh, he was the chairperson of art education in the state of, in the state of California. And and the, the association, not not the super not, not the state, no, not the state. So he was the head of the state association. Oh, well, that's okay. And and so he had he had connections all up and down the state, and, and so, and and this this had a lot to do with a lot of what we were doing because. We were working in Swirl, so Southwest Regional Laboratory, is in Southern California. So we were we were usually trying things out for there before we sent them out to the rest of the country. But this whole thing, one conversation, one idea, one concept, these things all came together with Dwayne and, and Lonnie Duke and Mickey and I and some other people that were involved. And we had what was that one year, a one year program? I think it was. No, no, no. Two, 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 two years. So it was several staff years. development project. Didn't say how long. Yeah, but with, what was Harry Brody? We had Harry Brody as a major consultant, and that was fascinating to get these teachers together and just hear an esthetician talk about art. That was an education in and of itself. So that like, part of that was talking about art with teachers. Yes. Oh, yes. very cool. With teachers, but but it was the. the well, he has all these original materials. It's, it's, anyway, maybe you bring them in some. You have all this, those aesthetic eye material. It was a curriculum. Uh -huh. Wasn't it developing yeah, curriculum yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for doing this? And it was about really based a lot in, in aesthetics, which later on most states dropped aesthetics because it was. People didn't understand. No, that they, they, they still don't understand. <laughs> 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 The fascinating thing is if you listen to kids talking about art, they make aesthetic statements. Mm -hmm. Did you spy the same with the adults, with the teachers? They make critical statements, they make historical statements, and they make aesthetic statements. Did they start out with superficial and then lead to the... Did they start out with superficial mm -hmm. statements and then yeah. oh, the nice. sure. to the critical? Sure, sure. Did they? Did you? They read the naive to sophisticated business that we wrote. Did you? Yeah. 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 Did you guys read the naive to sophisticated? I don't think no, so. No, no, you didn't read it. A walk in the right direction. Yeah, a walk in the right direction. Somebody was assigned to read that. Was assigned to read that. <laughs> I was just saying it reminded me of what <laughs> Jess was saying on last week about the, yeah. the research with the when they talked about, about the artist or the um, yeah. viewer. How they talk about. Yeah. Oh, Michael Parsons. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Like the what when looking at the artwork, what they, how they, yeah. they first got it first. To, yeah. yeah. Kind of so. mm -hmm. yeah. Margie, I think everybody was supposed to read it. Was everybody supposed to read that, or was this one one assignment? Mm -hmm. The first one yeah. was assignment. The, who, yeah, whose assignment was it? Fess up. Yeah. We didn't do that yeah. because we. Oh, that's okay. okay. You did the other two. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 the reason that the work is all defensive. No, have to come back well, what? No, you know why? Because no, you said, Ellie, you said very something very important. That's my fault. <laughs> no, no, because you said, were they naive when they started? Yeah, and that's yes, 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 yes. Th this article that Gail and I wrote, I was so a student, Walk in the right direction. Yeah. Walk in the, we got that, like the Barkin Award for this um, in our field. And it, it is, if you want to read it, it has the, it is an outline of how you go from naive to sophisticated. And it has the, um, up I don't know, what am I looking at? I can't see. <laughs> I think we, we did talk about this yeah, last we, week. Yeah, we talked about that. I the notion about 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 naive to sophisticated. Is it the was one of the, no, the that one was the one, the, it has this in it. Is that the one with the chameleon so, walking across the No, that's a different one. That's a different one. You're all getting crazy. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, anyway, the only reason I mention it is that was the whole goal, to go from a naive to uh -huh. a sophisticated sure. viewer of art. That was the whole goal. 
And who mentioned uh, about you were mentioning? I forgot your name again. Jin Yi. Jin Yi. Jin Yi. Jin Yi. Jin Yi. G J. Jin J I N Y I I. Mention oh, right. <laughs> um, the producing an informed citizenship. Mm -hmm. People who were informed, they didn't have to be artists, but they were appreciators of art. Mm -hmm. And in our culture, we have people who appreciate things, and, and we don't have schlock and terrible. <laughs> you know, I mean, then, then, um, then, then we're doing something important. So if everybody goes from being naive to much more sophisticated, some of them in their art making, a lot of them in how they appreciate and look at art, they're gonna buy art for their homes, they're gonna support artists. So it's very important that we educate them. I think it's interesting that you take the stance on um, going that naive to sophisticated in, in the way you've explained it, that you're not giving a, um, a qualitative uh, assignment to it, and that they are becoming uh, more sophisticated, but they don't have to know the name or the date or the you know the things that you would be tested on in a uh, in a you know in an art history class. But they're going to take more away from it. They're going to be more sophisticated about how they talk right. about it. But somehow it it goes to go their the emotions other rather than yeah. the, you know it triggers the emotions. Yeah. But more than anything else, it, it triggers well, curiosity <laughs> about it, aren't you? That's where I work. Well, yeah. emotions, you have to think of emotions broadly. Curiosity is an emotion, in a sense. Yeah, I, I think you, you, I was sort of at 90 degrees to this discussion when you looked at my face. I've been thinking about something that pertains to this, but not directly to the conversation. And I know we want to take a break, so I'm okay. not going to. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> you want to take a break? There are some prepared things, but only there's two thinking back going, wait. I didn't hear your shirt. You think they make me your best. I'm going to add you. supposed to be a right answer to everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Gil has some an interesting image up here. Do you want to, <laughs> were you going to talk about these? I want, I want, I'll, I'll start off shocking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> these two pictures were made in one classroom. Mm -hmm. Why do they look so different? Different ages. Were they done by people of different ages? Were they done by people of different ages? Uh, uh, well, not very much. A few months different. Oh, they were given freedom. Yes. <laughs> That's true. Training. Training. Background. Background. Had different training. Did they had different training. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. That's good. 
Um, oh, what? Oh, I'm sorry. One with uh, not looking at the paper. Or one that's done at the earlier stage, like when you're talking about the first stage, second, like maybe they were just done at different points and they were at the same time, did you say? Or no? They were they were two children the same age. Same class. Same age, but in the same class. But in the same class. But not at a later point in the class? No. Oh, okay. No. So what do you want to know? Did they have different time frame to do them? Did they have the same time frame? Yes. You know what? You got it. So up. Yeah. <laughs> Kill the bears here in Yates. Oh, did know. they use same tools? Did they use the, the same, same tools? tools? Uh, basically, yes, but very, very, very different. <laughs> it seems to me that. Oh, I'm sorry. We're not finished. Um, was one of them using a tracing table? Like like was one using a tracing table? Oh no no no. Was there a specific problem or a question? They were asked to draw themselves. Okay. To me, I see level of interest in what they're doing. You know, I feel like the top may not have been as interested in doing the activity as the one on the bottom seemed very passionate about doing. It. To me. Okay. Okay. Part part of what we were working on when we were working on DVAE is to move kids from the first level to the next level as much as possible in a relatively short time. I mean, you can work on it a whole year, but you still don't know. We're talking about our time every day, and that's very limited. But you can actually take a child who draws like the top picture and teach him to draw like the bottom picture if they accept the instruction. Mm -hmm. and that's a critical issue. Mm -hmm. but, but this is this is what we were about. We were, we were trying to move people from that first limit. I and mean, this is this is <coughs> unsophisticated as you can get to this level, which has a high degree of sophistication. But you've got to get everybody to see it the same way. And you've got to get that person at the top to say, I want to do better. That's part of what your instruction has to involve. And, and, and I did, I've got instance after instance after instance here. And I, okay, here's, here's a, <laughs> That's naive to very sophisticated. That's a, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> when kids are bringing this home, and they are very unsophisticated as the top drawing, parents react rather poorly. Although they display the work, and they feel proud of their child, but they, they're, they're not impressed. Now, if you can move each of those drawings from the very naive level that we saw in the beginning to the more sophisticated level, that you're going to make a very major different impression. And this is what, you know, this is, this is basically what we were trying to do. And I, I've got all kinds of things here, and I don't want to, I don't want to overdo it. But let me just, let me just start out with typical primary school artwork. <laughs> <laughs> now, why do children draw like this when they're in primary school? It's the question of why? Why are they drawing like this when they're in primary school? Well, that's one of the questions I had for the very first one you put up with the top slide and then the very um, naive to sophisticated. Wait, sure. These seem to be in earlier stages of development. How does that um, change with your your sequencing? Did the, does it matter what stage of development the student is in, or is that theory not applicable? Well, it, it depends on how much you want to contribute. Yeah. One of the things that you want to contribute is to both of those people. Going back to the first, right. 
you want to improve the bottom one and you want to improve the top one. But you can't do that instructionally the same way. You have to adapt the instruction according to what they bring to it. But these kids are drawing typical primary age drawings. Why do they look like that? Why, why, why don't they look better? Well, one reason is that they, they're drawing what's important to them. And they're drawing the eyes and the Yes, face. they do draw what's important. Very true. But then so is the same girl at the top on the, on the two images on the wall. Mm -hmm. Are you looking for a cognitive process? Is that the question you're asking us? Like, Partly. <laughs> well, they're, they're symbols of people rather than the appearance of people. Yes, why? Um, because that's... They haven't been trained to see. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Say it again. They haven't been trained to see. To write model. Okay, okay. Well, they haven't learned to see. But they, there's something else they haven't learned. Articulate what they, they see. They can't articulate what they right. see. They yeah. absolutely cannot articulate what they see. They have to be taught. Yeah. You don't just give kids art materials and say, make a picture. You've got to, you owe them some instruction that's going to make it possible for them to do that in a meaningful way. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm going back to what DBAE was all about and what we were trying to do with that. But if you, if you accept this without instruction, you're leaving a child at a very low level of development. What age was this? Do you, do you know? What age was this? These are, these are primary, I'm not sure, first or second grade. Okay. Wouldn't that depend on what your goal is, though? Mm -hmm. But what would be your say, goal? Say something a little more about that. <clears throat> so if, and I guess maybe this goes back to what the purpose of art education in a school setting is. If sure. it is okay. to teach students, and I think maybe this is like the core of DBAE, to teach students to see and do what they're seeing in a way, you know, translate what their eyes are telling them into what they can do with their hands. So cognitive to motor skills kind of. Um, but if the if the end goal is more of like art therapy or self-expression, which was sort of the earlier forms of art education in schools, then wouldn't this be a perfectly fine way to leave a child's development and see how it naturally arises. I think you're making a very important point. Is a teacher doing art therapy or is a teacher doing something other than talk, teaching about art? What would you say the purpose of art education in the school should be? Is that a very large question? <laughs> well, it's, it's to improve the art making of the children. And the more we can well, this is a bad example in one sense because I'm sure you, what, what, we want these people to become more realistic. But, but it, it, realism is not the end. The end is better control of what they want and what they can create. Okay. Because when they get to about the fifth grade, if they're drawing like that and they haven't had instruction, then they're completely turned off from art. Not only are they turned off from art, making it, they're turned off from looking at other people's art because they feel what they're doing is childish. They feel like they can't express what they want to. Right, and, but they're learning to be more sophisticated in science and math and writing mm -hmm. and other subjects. Mm -hmm. and, and if they're doing music, they're learning to play at a different level, instruments, or even listen and appreciate. But if you leave them at a, at a certain level and you don't give them some instruction as they need it and want it, then by the fifth grade, they're going to turn off completely from wanting to do and make art. What do we see in these drawings that, that are improved from the ones that I just showed you? The proportion is more right. <laughs> like body proportion is more right. Like yeah, more that's balance. good. That's good. Actions. Smoking. Okay. They're doing actions. They're, in some cases, yes, they're showing, portraying yeah. actions. Side view, significant views. Side view rather than frontal view. Such a dimension of the body, too, that there's okay. volume. Now, how do they get to this level? 
observing. You've been observing uh, real people. First observe. First observing. Mm -hmm. Very much so, and they have to be taught to observe. Right. Copying. 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 Yeah. Copying. Sure. Yes. Hardly. Sure. Mm -hmm. Who else? Anyone else? There's other things happening. What, what else is happening? Practice. Practice. You cannot overemphasize that word. Artists don't create without a great, 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 great deal of practice. And if you want children to learn to draw well, you've got to give them a lot of practice, a great amount of practice. And the more they get, the better they're going to be eventually. Not all the same. They, some of them move very swiftly and some of them move not so swiftly. But the difference between these and the first images I showed you is practice. And I could go through this. I've got too many of these. Uh, here's a child trying to depict a scene. <coughs> the child is obviously very young. What do they learn? What do they need to be taught? To do that better. Perspective. Yeah. Perspective. Perspective is going to make an obvious difference. What else? Well, the horse is going one way, and the cart's going like. <laughs> yes. yeah. Okay. Like it. Like it. Okay. Getting everything on the same plane. You know, yes. Yes. Stand one of these over. If you need angles. Clear if that's a ground line underneath the horse, or yeah. shadows. Yeah. Shadows. 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 Okay, or now what you're saying <laughs> says these are things I need to teach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All of you, all of you that are pointing out what can we do to improve this. These are things that you need to teach. Mm -hmm. And so you go back to the one, two, three, four over here, A, B, C, D, and you begin to see what you need to do to move them toward a level of greater competence. Gilda's attention between unfolding, which was part of the Lodenfeldian idea, unfolding of your artistic ability at different levels, and the idea that you can learn how Anybody who does not have something physically or mentally um, challenged can learn how to draw well. Yes. We've seen it all over the world. But there's been an enamorment of children's artwork looking cute. Oh, isn't it cute how the bird's eye view here and, and how they made the horse with, you know, and, and it is very appealing. And, and we can enjoy it, but we can also help people to have more ability to draw better. How do you bridge that conversation without squishing their mm -hmm. little spirit? Mm -hmm. Don't you think they want to, yeah. to draw better? What if they think that's a beautiful photo? They're like, this is the best yeah. thing I've ever done. And you're sitting there going, mm. but, but you don't feel the pain. that way. I mean, I, I feel you, but on the other hand, it's not like in math class that they said, oh, Jean, if you think three and three is 14, I hate to, you know, I don't want to make you feel bad. <laughs> it isn't 14, you know? It's, why is it in art that we are responsible for children's emotions in a way that no one else, I'm not just asking you, no, I, mean, I yes. don't want to know. Um, so how's this? There isn't a real answer in this since you're expressing themselves. It's a right. personal There is no and, real, there is yeah. no right answer in yeah. art. That's kind of the point. The but I don't think that that's true. I mean, if, well, they, if uh, there's... Let me, let, me, let me just say... I'm oh, sorry. These were written by a German who was reflecting on young children's inability to depict things well. And he listed these attributes as something that they need to do as a teacher to improve. If kids, if kids had a lack of ability to discriminate accurately, then what can you do as a teacher to help them learn to discriminate accurately? Mm -hmm. You don't have to tell them that this is bad. Well, you just they well, take that information and right. introduce yeah. them to the something next that they make an right. connection. Okay. Next okay. Okay. Unless you have a very different if, if, you, if you go through this whole list, there's a years of instruction in art right there. <laughs> if you can get a child to learn all these ten things and do them well, 
you've made a huge difference in those children's ability to think what they wanted to think or to represent what they wanted to represent. And also while teaching being proud and having confidence is important, teaching modesty is also important. So yes. Like yes. I would say to answer your question though, to, uh, to, if you want something like more concrete, um, well, what I've found that works for you know kids I've been with is to you know the idea of bookending of saying I really like and being very detailed. We talked about that in a lot of our classes. It's it's not okay just to say like that's a great photo or that's a great drawing. You know, it's about I like that you did this. I love that you put um, five petals on this flower. Mm -hmm. um, and then the next thing is if you want me to show you how you could. Um, draw eyes, I can show you how to draw eyes. Or if you want me to show you how to, you know, add the body, here's how one way you could do it, you know? And I think it's just about, for me at least, it's about different levels or different ages, you know, of like third grade. And what, what is the age where you really start kind of, you know, really giving a lot more instruction versus letting them really focus on the process? Mm -hmm. so. We see this with our M135 students that are high, that are college level students, and many of them stopped developing because they never really had good art instruction or they lost interest when they were in the sixth grade, but mostly they lost interest because they didn't feel like they were progressing. And they show up in this class and we have a range like the range that you showed. I mean, some that are shockingly naive and some that are amazingly wonderful. And this is the approach that we take. When they put something up, we have the other students talk. And they, they're very supportive. I mean, in terms of, sometimes it takes them a minute to respond because they're sh shocked at how bad something is. <laughs> but then they'll say, oh, well, I can see that what you're doing is you're showing a, a shadow. Mm -hmm. And um, that's good that you're showing a shadow. Perhaps if you would lighten it a little bit so that it didn't look like it was a black, you know, yeah. they don't say it looked like an ink blob, but you know, they, they will begin to, to give one another instruction. But the, the, the things that you pointed out there were exactly the kinds of things that they are giving to one another. Yes. And we off, and fortunately now we have Photoshop to help us because sometimes you can take their image that is pretty bad and put it in Photoshop and show how to light, what it would look like if this part were lightened or if this were straight and so it's not leaning. And they see that and they think it's amazing because they see that technology as non-threatening. You know, the technology is doing it. Someone is not telling me it's bad. <coughs> the technology is showing me how to do it correctly. And you can see some amazing um, development in just one semester. That's, that's what I want to get to. <laughs> what you see on the screen is a paper that a teacher crumpled up and threw in the wastebasket because she disapproved of it. What? Why did she disapprove of it? Because it's a decapitated figure down there with her head. Is that pop culture? Yeah. Brian, what do you see in it? What was the assignment? Why would she have thrown it away? <laughs> Cartoony. Cartoony and even manga, even. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It looks like 80s superheroes. Yeah. <laughs> what does it represent to you? <laughs> what was this? It looks, it reminds me of Bokusai and his sketchbooks. What's that? It reminds me of Bokusai and his sketchbooks with all sorts of people doing all sorts of things. All why do boys, girls, why do they make these kinds of drawings? Well, there's a lot of activity. I mean, you can keep yourself sure. busy with that. Neither for a long this time. child cannot turn in a piece of paper without drawing on it first, <laughs> <laughs> and that the teacher disapproves of. Uh -huh. Oh, is, so it was oh, supposed to be a worksheet. Well, this is supposed to be a worksheet. Oh, this is science. We don't have any materials. Tested. Yeah. No, this is, this is a social studies assignment. <laughs> and the teacher threw it away because the kid drew on it instead of writing the answers yeah. that she wanted. Yeah. What are the answers? Now, what does this say to you as a prospective art teacher? Give me that kid. <laughs> Let me have that kid in my class. Okay, exactly right. Exactly right. 
here's a kid who is doing what Hokusai did and everybody else did. He's making practice imagery. And he makes practice imagery on every piece of paper he turns in practically. Now this kid is a damn good artist. But it took him a long time to get there. And that you have to recognize and accept if you're going to accept the, the imagery as practice. But the teacher threw it away. And I think that's one of the things that's really How disturbing. How did she get it after she threw it away? So Pardon me? Or someone else wrecked rescued it? Digging through other people's trash. It's got a property, what's it? That's right. That's true. Here's some experimentation with an image that some of you may recognize. Oh, Gil, it's on the side. Now, again, this is a student who wants to represent something and he's practicing on paper, just practicing. Are the drawings right? Are they correct? What do you mean correct? That's, that's what I'm trying to get. <laughs> They're closer to being representational of the real. Okay. They're closer to being representational. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's what the child's trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. Now how do you help this child instructionally? What can you teach this child that they don't have that's going to improve these drawings so that they're more representational than they were today, right now, on this one. Mm -hmm. Horse anatomy and the yeah, location of the muscles. Right. Okay, Which very good. Mm -hmm. Now, if you start doing that, think about it. You're teaching something that other people are supposed to teach that you're not supposed to, you might say. The idea, you said it very well. If, we're, if we start taking this seriously, and we have to teach anatomy when it's required. Mm -hmm. If the image is going to be what the child wants it to be, you've got to teach them what they need to learn in, to, in order to improve their own drawings. Mm -hmm. Now this child is much older than <laughs> some of the ones I showed earlier. Mm -hmm. but, but this child can be improved. Mm -hmm. And it takes your instruction to make that improvement happen. This, this is what, I, I, DBA is drowned in a, in a mountain of accusations. <laughs> but what no one ever accepts is that what it says is teachers have to take teaching as a responsibility and take it as far as you need to take it with every student. And that's, that's a major demand. And that's different than where we're trained. Unfortunately. I, I, I've got too many of these. I could go on and on and on. Uh, we're enjoying it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We'll have to, uh, in the class next year, the contemporary art, we'll have to book him for about, Nina mm -hmm. and Gil for about five lessons. Uh, yeah. <laughs> He's the part two. <laughs> Anybody recognize that name? Yes. The boy that drew this is an English boy. How old do you think he might have been? How old? Yes. 14 or 15. 11, 14, 15. Anybody else? 16. 12. 12? 16. 16. 17. 17, okay, we've got a whole range four. of our lessons. Four. <laughs> <laughs>
to eight and a half. Oh, oh. that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, what does a teacher do with an eight and a half year old who can draw like that? Uh, beg them to draw things for me. Well, he probably would have to become his agent. <laughs> 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 love his agent. <laughs> Refer him to some a specialist or someone in a gifted yeah. program. Refer him to a gifted program if he are. But he yeah, might not something. be good at drawing something else. Yeah, maybe he just does this. Oh, maybe he does these. No, searches. this child draws. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All kinds of things. If you look at the building. But then look at the cars on the bottom. They're done in a very naive way. Yes. So he's very good at looking at architecture. Yeah. And you'll notice a lot of children who have high ability in the visual arts at a young age, they specialize. Mm -hmm. So that, like the horse person, yeah. the horse girls, the architecture boys, and then it goes on. So, so that that child still needs to look at other things besides... If these were all improved, it would make a significant difference in this drama. Well, I mean, he, I like he, yeah. he probably <laughs> wants to focus on drawing. Well, you look, look at this. What's good about it? You can talk to him. Yeah, I'd probably ask yes. him what... Um, what would you like to do would better? You, yeah. what, what would you change? You change? Well, we, my first instinct was to say, okay, well, let's talk about composition because there's all this blank space. But yes. I would, I would want to talk to the child and find out, did you intend for it to be blank, or would you want, okay. you know? So, I'd have to either see more or find out details of his thought process. Okay, you know? that's good. That's important. Well, so, I mean, I guess this might be you're talking about this child and his growth, but another thing that I would probably do or consider uh, maybe is. Um, how can he also help other kids with their drawing skills? Like, okay. I, th I think that's, that that's, really that's cool. a difficult problem. Uh, certainly, he could help some other children learn to draw better. There's no question. And he may, he may take that rule on in the classroom. Mm -hmm. But if he doesn't take that rule on in the classroom, I don't think we ought to give him that rule. Mm -hmm. Some of us also don't know how they it's hard to articulate right, what they do. Right. But you can also show an artwork like this and say to the students, what do you see, what do you like about oh, sure. so-and-so's artwork, <laughs> what's the best part? And then, and then if the children are in a trusting environment, well, where, what can he do to make it better? And then and it's, you always start with what's good about everything. And he could be in the group. Yeah, well, yes, of course. And, and if he's listening, then he's going to make a better drawing the next time he tries. But sometimes if the, the children tell one another, the student, it carries more weight than if you do. How do you keep from overpraising this child and discouraging the other children? I mean, this kid obviously has some crazy talent, right? Yeah, and he's and covered just reads of paper with drawings. Just comes out and, yeah. And all these other kids are eight and a half drawing, typical eight and a half year old drawings. How do you keep from, how do you honor his work as well as theirs without putting one down in the same classroom? That's a good question, and that's a, that's, that's a little bit touchy, but it's, it's a very serious problem. Uh, I think you display the artwork by the whole age group. I mean, in other words, there's going to be different kids at different developmental levels. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to display the art, you probably should display all those levels. But everybody's going to see the difference. Mm -hmm. But you know... But you don't call attention to the difference. But children in my research, and in what we did, at Pete, we did a lot of research, children with high ability in the arts, the children in the classroom know that some people have more ability in art than others. Some people are better in math. Some people are better in science. You know, and that people bring to the table different abilities. It's the adults who are worried yeah. that the children are going to feel bad. It's the adults who are worried to measure one person against another. <clears throat> you know, so that I think that it's the way you handle the situation. If, if you're, you know, some people will be able to talk about art better than others. Some people can write criticism better than others. 
Children realize that there are different ability levels in the class. They do. If you don't <clears throat> say, oh, look, this is what I want you to do, this, I've heard this in our classes, this is right, this is what little Gilbert did, <laughs> see here, and you should all be doing this, then that's, that that's, a, that's not a good message. <clears throat> but a message that everybody comes to the table with different abilities, but we can all learn, and we can all do artwork and talk about it and make it and, and, and at, a, at a, a level, you know, that, that's appropriate for age. Mm -hmm. And I don't think if you don't make um, value one thing over another and say one is good and one isn't, mm -hmm. the children are, children are usually pretty, they know who the class artists are. Mm -hmm. that they don't, but they would like to learn, well, you, well, you've done studies and people who are doing um, uh, fan, the, art. fan art. Right. Right. And so they know who the people are who have the good art right. and those who can help others. And so I, if it's not, if you don't say this is what everybody should be doing, I don't think, it, I don't know, from my many years of teaching at uh, 10 years in New York City in the elementary schools and you know, that, that, that I, don't, I, I don't think it is an issue, but I don't know if you want to add to it, Gil. Um, you want to add to well, it? Well, I, I, mean, I remember vividly, I was teaching sixth grade, and the principal sent me a note. He wanted a child who could draw well to come to the office because he wanted a hand project for it. You weren't teaching. You were teaching. Sixth grade. Uh, high ability students, uh, no. not art class. Not at this time. I was teaching regular class. That's our regular class, okay. And and I I said to the kids, I have this note from the principal, and he wants a boy who's who draws well to come to the office to help him with the project. Who should I send? Twenty hands went up, and twenty kids said Brian. And I thought to myself, I've never seen an artwork by Brian since I've been here. Brian was a fantastic artist. But he did it at home. Mm -hmm. And he showed kids in the neighborhood. He never showed it to me as an art teacher. Mm -hmm. That's a shock. Mm -hmm. That's a real shock. Is that him, Brian Goldberg over there? <laughs> what happened to Brian? <laughs> this is another social studies paper that the teacher was throwing away. Mm -hmm. Oh, my. From another kid? From another kid. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, it's the same teacher. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> it's like hard feeling hard. Well, I, I have a question related to that topic. I don't know if I can extend this experience I've had recently to younger people or not, so I'll be interested in, in opinions on that. Right now, in the class that I'm teaching, I have one student who is leagues, years, light years ahead of the other students. I, they turn in things, you know, little folded up things on uh, construction paper, and she turns in these gorgeously realized watercolors with me. We can Yeah. You know who I'm talking yeah. about. And so that question comes up, like, how do I deal with the fact? You know, like, I want her to know I like her work without. But it seems like she's really aware of the situation. It's been that way. And so, you know, uh, I say, good work. She says thanks. And I don't actually have to praise her that much because it's her thing. Mm -hmm. She, she's rewarded by the doing. Mm -hmm. Is that true of younger children as well, that they would be kind of aware, like, oh yeah, I know I'm probably better than my peers and you don't have to tell me that, I already know. But the high ability middle school students that we studied for many years felt that what they didn't want to be told how good their artwork was, because they knew that they would do yeah. it. Mm -hmm. They really disliked teachers who said, Oh, this is a wonderful. Yeah. They wanted someone who would say, this is good. This is what's good about this. This is what you have to work yeah. on. Yeah. They wanted critical feedback. So it, it's right. almost they like a self-correcting problem. If you take your cue from the kid, the kid doesn't want to hear a lot, then you're OK. Most, I guess, oh, sorry. No, most children know if they're good or they're good in any subject, mm -hmm. in writing, whatever. And you always start with saying you did well in this and such. And you, but, but, the, the ones who are at the you know high ability in art, they want to do better. They want criticism. They were really upset when someone said, "Oh, very, you know, art teacher, very good or nice work." 
they said, that person really didn't pay any attention to what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Because they didn't give me feedback to make my stuff better. I guess where I was coming from is I have distinct memories of being in like, I guess it kind of goes back to the, have you heard the Creativity by Ira Glass? He talks about the gap. And it goes back to, like, I have memories of being in middle school and drawing self-portraits and looking at the kid next to me and being like, his is so good, I want to know, how, I'd like, I want to be able to do that. And feeling very discouraged because my ability, I knew I could do better, but I didn't know how to get there. And if I hadn't been passionate about art and, like, super interested in, and have that drive, like, if I had been someone who was like, I can't do that, discouraged, I give up. Like, I, how do you keep kids from doing that? How do you keep them? Teach them. You teach them. You teach them. Yeah. Teach them. yeah. You teach them. Open up question. I mean, like, would you open up question and be like, what do you want to do? You know, you know, you're, you're describing a situation that teachers don't take advantage of, typically. If, if, if I've got a teacher, if I've, if I've got a student, and they're sitting next to Marjorie, and Marjorie buzzed very, very well. Yeah, Marjorie. <laughs> and I want to be able to do that, but I can't. Yeah. But that's an admission that a teacher can really take advantage of. Mm -hmm. And to help that student make those drawings better, they see that they're getting better, and they appreciate it. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they work at it. But the teacher has to have ability, too. The teacher has that's to have ability. That's why I'm taking art classes. That's and, true. And the teacher, I think, Although I don't show artwork, and I'm always doing artwork, always drawing, making slides, and doing PowerPoints, and painting, and doing things. And, and, and so uh, I think that, in my own opinion, I think it agrees, that if you're going to be teaching, you need to be practicing your artwork as well, and working with the children, and keeping up your skills. Because if I don't have skills, and a lot of people go into teaching because they couldn't develop their skills in the art programs. I mean, yeah. but if you have good skills and money, I think you have to keep them up personally. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I, I think that if you as a teacher could say to your old, your, your young self, what do you need? What do you need? How can I help you? Mm -hmm. And you say to yourself, I want to be able to draw the nose so it looks correct. Mm -hmm. The eyes, his looks Mine looks funny. What's wrong with my ear? Yeah. And then, 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 then you get the students to articulate, but you've got to get the skills to tell them where to come from there. Yeah. And not everybody has those skills. Because if you're teaching music, and somebody's playing something, and they're not using blessing, and they're not using the correct um, notes, notes yeah. say, you know, then you've got to. Say, wait, this sounded a couple way when you got here. It should sound like this, not like this. But you draw on children's artwork was another. Yeah. Some, sometimes, I know people go around with a plastic and overlay. Mm -hmm. Other people sketch on the side. Some people say, do you mind? you doing a sketch or something like that. I can show you with a few lines. So you can, it, it, it depends on your relationship with the children and what you want to do. but. There was a whole onus, don't ever touch the artwork, don't ever criticize. You know, and, and that's what you would, so I remember Dwayne always showing these pictures of um, <laughs> dragons. Yeah. And one, had, one was a kind of well-articulated, but expression is a dragon. The other one is a kind of, you know, one eye here and a little loopy. <laughs> and it was a cute children's drawing of a dragon, just what you did. And people always also, there's an enamorment with art that looks like it was made by children. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. oh, it's so cute. Mm -hmm. Don't don't give them any more skill because they won't be doing it. And their artists write about how their creativity waned because they had this wonderful childlike way of drawing was taken away from them. And but it, 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 it's if you are trained well, educated well, really, how to, how to draw it. How to, that you could go back to doing things purposefully mm -hmm. at any level, doing something. So I mean, there were there, but that's another thing that that you're always fighting. This kind of cute children's art. You do you all know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's so cute, and and, and it, it is cute when you're in the second grade. When you're in the fifth grade, it's not so cute anymore. And that's how you feel. I want to really draw 
something that looks, um, has some realism that isn't that what you're getting at? Yeah, yeah. And, and so it's. Um, well, not, not only realism, but just the ability to, to, to pick things something, things right. And sure. depict it accurately. And whether, whether it's realistic in terms of a human or, or a scene of some kind. Right. Yeah. Even even students who do things that are cartoony, they say I want it to look real, meaning mm -hmm. that yeah, even though it's solid. imaginary, it could function. I mean, the arms are big enough that would hold it up, or you know, the, the neck is strong enough to hold it up, so that there's there is a I don't want to say it, a it's realism credible. of possibility, credibility, Not credibility of it, yeah, a logic, yeah, yeah, a logic to it. Well, we definitely are going to have to have you guys come back. <laughs> Everybody's wilty, and some people have to drive long distances. <laughs> yeah. I'm also out of the combo. Oh, you asked me to say something about the gift of talent. Yes, yes, the gift of talent program that I have been telling many of you about, and some of you have already well, been, well, uh, talked about. Yeah, I think just both of you have, have, have supported the classes now last semester. Right. I, you can send me an email to tell you more about it, but here, this is my email. And by the way, um, Dr. Clark and Dr. Zimmerman are experts at Gifted and Talented, too, and they got a grant in their own right a big grant to do some research with uh, gifted and talented students. So uh, besides being art educators, they're also <laughs> right. gifted and talented. <laughs> but but um, the program is over. It's, it's a licensing program. So um, people who are taking the class would, oh, can either it's minor, an or they're minor in, but you get a license attached to your first license if you are interested in licenses, but you don't have to be, but if you are, um, it's over two summers and it's two classes each summer. And after two summers, you, you know, um, you take a test. And it's a wonderful class. <laughs> oh, I have to take a yeah. test. No, no test. Well, no test. I, I have to take a test. Yeah, no, there's, there's, there's a test for the license edition. It's new. Yeah. It's the with Pearson. It's for oh, Pearson. Oh. Oh, they, oh, now you have to take it. Yeah. Oh. And it's like, it's like $200. Oh, no. $200. Yeah. It's like $100. Yeah. Oh, well, it's yeah. to make money. That's yeah. 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 It's yeah. ridiculous. You won't have any problem passing the test. <laughs> <laughs> Those tests are so low level. But anyway, um, so but, but we now have to take a test because we don't have any entrance. If you do the work you're supposed to. We had a great class last time. It was. Okay. Um, so this um, uh, this summer we're going to have, but which I forget which is, Janice is teaching. Is it the curriculum class? And we practicum. What? Yeah, practicum is curriculum. I'm teaching the crap, which is the capstone. In order to take the capstone, you have to have at least one other gifted talent to class. Because this is a term in the, the last class in the series, so if you take one before, if you've taken another one, then you can take that. So you, if you want to just take the one class, Janice Bizarri was teaching that, and she was one of my doctoral students, like you were, you were one of my doctoral students. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody else was there. <laughs> so, um, I mean, and I can send you all the questions, and I have a, you want to correspond with me about it, there's a lot of people already signed up for it. And you, you can sign up for the first night again, right? You, you, you sign, sign up, up the first day. It's one week intensive from 9 to 4, but it's usually 5 every day for a week. And then you do a project of your own, anything you are interested in related to the class. And it's like what, what Gil put on the board. You know, <laughs> that's what we do. We, so, if you, so that's the other. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. the, the, that, I, I understand you can just people have to leave it anyway. <laughs> um, just send me an, an email. You register the first day of each class. And I did forward that to Jeff Heller, this guy that came in from. Oh, I Jeff had to talk to him. Yeah, I forgot. I, I said I forwarded it to him. So all that yeah. information. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he should have that. But I know Tracy's going to be in the class. Should I talk Brian? to him? Brian. 
Uh, is there anybody else that's planning on taking it? Jin Yi, are you going to be taking it? No. Are you taking that class? No? Anybody else? I'm, I don't, my plans are constantly changing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know when I'm graduating, what I'm doing. <laughs> we had um, most three or four art people, and the rest were open. It was great. We had, it was, it was, it was really cool. The class was about creativity. So it was, uh, uh, mm -hmm. so, Really, and then the capstone classes, a lot of, one thing I'm doing is leadership and developing leadership so people learn how to advocate for the arts and do and, and other things like that. Um, so, but but it's, it, because it's a capstone where, you know, it's a, it's a, ter, a German, terminal? A terminal degree? Yeah, it's so a terminal class. class terminal the, class. So you just take it out of order? You would just take this summer and then next summer? Yes, you can take one before, then you yeah, can take right. it out of order. But you, you can't just take mine because it's assumed you have some background. You can't just take the second week. You have to take the first week to take the second oh, week. Oh, OK, thank you very Got much. It. There's, 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 it's, there's, a, it's a two-week course. <laughs> no, there's two. two courses. No, it's two courses, right. but Each is you, a week. this summer, you have to take Basically, them both together. Right. Yeah. Oh, oh, I didn't know. Does that make sense? Okay, because last summer I just took one of the You just took the creativity. Yeah, right. just did. This summer you have to take both. Or, you could or take you've already taken the creativity, so you can take the cat. The Janice's. Yeah. She's my neighbor. Who is? Janice. Oh, really? I don't know. Oh, well, Janice's isn't the capstone. Ian's is. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, <laughs> those of you that are still here that are interested, you can email Enid, and if you don't have her email, I can give I that to you. Oh, she put it up there. Also, um, next year in the fall is the Z550 or Z750. So all of you that are taking master's courses and, and are not finished yet, you should sign up for it. And it's contemporary issues in contemporary art education, about which these two are experts. Um, Enid's book on creativity is coming out soon. So um, we'll have to have them back and again. And then our book on a cultural sensitivity. Some universe it will come out. But anyway, yeah. So. All of you sign up for that, and um, <laughs> we only have one more class of this. Oh, two. Well, two, two, more classes. two. Well, I know, but one more where we talk. The other one you're presenting. Great things about everybody. This is a she, fabulous she, group she of people. Tell she put it on Facebook in this class. <laughs> do you do that? Yes, I did. I walked away feeling like I walked away. Well, you know, I had a class last week thinking about like when I with feminism. Uh huh. Yeah, where where I experienced that first. We'll be talking about that next next uh, fall. I was racking my brains trying to think, and I realized what it was. It was my first Joan Jett album in fifth grade. There you go. Experience in the Arts Boost Academic oh, Performance yeah. and FISC's Champions of Change Executive Summary. So we will talk about that and then the presentation of your papers will be on May the 1st. And remember that your papers also have to have a artwork. If you don't have the paper totally done, you can turn the paper in on May the 8th, but you still have to present your ideas on May the 1st. Are you okay, Brian? Uh, Brian, he hit his crazy boat. Oh. Oh. Your artwork, you weren't finished by the 1st. Right? <laughs> Sorry. I should have done it. I was just screaming. <laughs>